So is everyone awake this morning? I know I am now. <laughs> so um, it's funny, I have, a, I have always have USB sticks with presentations and perhaps some other things with me at all times. So surprise keynotes are no surprise at all. Um, one of the things that I love about our community of hackers it, that I've been a part of for at least 30 years of my life, since I was about 15 years old, is that we all come together when we are needed. And hopefully, coming together with you right now about hacking the planet is exactly what we all needed. So today, I'm going to talk about the last 20 years of my professional career in hacking and what I've learned, and some of the lessons will hopefully be useful to you. How many of you have heard about a bug bounty? Bug bounty, right? The idea of paying hackers in exchange for telling you about vulnerabilities. Well, it's not just alliterative, it's something that can be quite useful, but also can be incredibly dangerous in the wrong hands. And I'll tell you what I mean. How many of you have heard there's actually a bug bounty buffet going on called Driven to Pwn? There's an exploitation contest right now. So I'm one of the judges. Of course, they'll have to get along without me for the next 43 minutes, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Um, for those of you who are interested in checking out the Driven to Pwn area, just follow the cube and, and go around and there are signs. But we have a number of contestants that we'll be evaluating later today. Um, and with that, I'll begin. So when this movie came out, we, this was really a documentary about hacker culture, our culture. Rollerblades and everything. Of course I had rollerblades. But what, what we thought back then was that if only we pointed out all of the flaws in code, that things would start getting better, right? And things would become easier to convince people that there was a problem and that they needed to build security in from the ground up. And in fact, the keynote speaker yesterday, how many of you saw Chris Weisopel's speech yesterday? Yeah, so he's the one, not the one in the middle <laughs> with the long hair, but the one uh, with the glasses and sort of the beard. But this was 1998, 21 years ago. Hackers were invited by US Congress to testify about how fragile the internet was when the internet was a lot smaller. So. What's funny about this is that we thought back then, this is it, this is the beginning of change. Wow, boy, did we underestimate things. So this book came out recently, and it was about Cult of the Dead Cow, which is an early hacker group. And it started in Texas and also had members in the Boston area. I grew up in Boston, and at my age, we didn't have you know, Twitter or any of these social media, our social media was dialing in to a bulletin board system. And the same bulletin board system as the members of this early hacker group were the bulletin board system that I dialed into as a teenager. And that's how it all began for me. So there is an actual presidential candidate in the United States now who was a member of this hacking group. So you'd think at this point, 20 years after first being invited to Congress, that we would have solved all of the internet's problems. They knew that they needed the help of hackers long ago to help secure the internet. And here we've been. Some of us have taken on careers, founded companies, become CSOs of some of the largest technology companies in the world out of this very group. So you'd think, problem solved forever. Well, we had a 20-year reunion at Congress, and I was lucky enough to be able to moderate that panel of the Loft folks. Um, Mudge actually brought a wig so that he could recreate the moment for everyone in the, in the Senate. But aside from hair, there's some things that have not changed about the internet at all, especially about how fragile it is and especially about how we need to come together to understand the vulnerabilities to try and prevent them in the future. Now, it only took 20 years for US Congress to invite me to testify myself. That's me trying to explain how to pronounce my last name. I eventually took to doing T-Rex arms in front of the Senate because my last name is like a dinosaur, Katie Masaurus Rex. Um, but the other photo is what the photo I send to family to explain what I do. What is it that you do exactly? And I help 
advise governments, large organizations, in how to properly handle vulnerability reports that come to them, but more importantly, how to understand the classes of vulnerabilities that they're seeing and employ some of the techniques that we hackers have known and have created to not just discover these bugs, but to prevent them in the future. Because honestly, we are losing the battle if we're chasing after one bug at a time. We have to start eliminating classes of bugs. So, bug bounties. When I started at Microsoft in 2007, they had sworn that they would never pay hackers for bugs. And why was that? At the time, they were receiving over 150,000 to 200,000 non-spam email messages a year trying to report vulnerabilities to them. So why would they add cash to that nightmare, right? So they had sworn publicly they would never pay bug bounties. Now, in 2010, something changed in the bug bounty landscape. Bug bounties really you know, started long before, most notably with Mozilla in 1995. But in 2010, Google started paying bug bounties. They paid 1,337, or leet, amount of dollars. And at that point, the bug bounty question came up again for all companies. Now, Microsoft had over 800 supported products and services, a certainly a different profile in terms of servicing than Google. A lot of its products touched other people's machines as opposed to Google's where they could potentially address a lot of vulnerabilities on their own servers, cuts down the testing requirements, cuts down the time to fix. So there was a lot of moving parts to figure out, one, how do we get this incredible volume of bug reports honed in to the bugs that we wanted at the time we wanted it? So what you're looking at right now um, that blue slide with the graph is the exact slide that was used to convince the head of Internet Explorer to pay for his own bugs. Now, why is that? Well, we looked at the data. We were already getting bug reports for free from the hacker community. Now, as you may know, there are various markets for bugs. Defense is only one of them. Bugs and exploits are bought and sold for offense purposes all the time. So. A critical vulnerability in IE at this time was certainly worth at least six figures. So rather than pay six figures for these bugs, we looked at the data of when are the bugs coming in for free. So the white data, the white graph, is showing very few vulnerabilities coming in during the IE 10 beta period. And then a huge spike after the beta period was over. So all these friendly hackers were finding the bugs writing them up and waiting until after the beta period to give them to us. Kind of the worst time for an engineering organization to get them, especially if you're trying to fix all the bugs, as, as many bugs as possible during beta. So why were they doing that? Why were these friendly hackers who are willing to turn over valuable bugs for free to Microsoft waiting and holding on to them until the worst possible time to tell us? Well, we had an incentive for them. It just wasn't money. It was recognition in a bulletin. There would be no bulletin if the bug was fixed during the beta period and only affected the beta. So the most valuable bugs to Microsoft to hear about early, we were hearing about way late. So I said, this is a traffic shaping exercise. We've already got friendly eyes. How do we move them, not towards the target we wanted, but towards the time? And I predicted that if we put a small bug bounty at the beginning of the IE 11 beta period, that we would shift that traffic of vuln reports that we were already expecting anyway. And we did. We got 18 bulletin class vulnerabilities. Those would be critical or important class vulnerabilities, each of them on the offense market worth at least $100,000. Anyone want to guess what we paid for them? It was roughly $28,000 in change total. And why was that? Well, we were willing to not just give them what they were wanting before, which was recognition, but also this was the very first historic time that Microsoft was ever paying individual hackers for bugs. So, mega recognition. And actually, in the audience is uh, one of my good friends, James Forshaw. And uh, that check on the other side was one that I had the pleasure to write to him. It was also gigantic. We called it James and the Giant Check, you know. But that was for a $100,000 bug bounty, the largest bug bounty that was an ongoing bug bounty prize at the time in 2013 that any vendor was running. 
defensively. And what was ironic about that was we were not looking for paying for an individual exploit. We were actually looking for new exploitation techniques. Why would we need those? Well, we already knew there were ways to defeat our mitigations, and we were working on it. But it takes time to make those architectural changes to really defeat um, some of the exploitation techniques that were out there. So we needed to know what the new exploitation techniques would, were going to look like in order to start building those defenses into the operating system of the future. Very valuable to us. Now, wouldn't the offense market like this type of technique too? I suppose. But existing techniques already were working. So part of this exercise was us bounding smarter, not harder. It wasn't about paying the most for these bugs. It was about understanding who is looking for our bugs and how do we shape how they're looking, when they're looking, why they're looking, in order to make it a win-win situation between them, the engineers at Microsoft, and the customers. So hack the punt. Hack the Pentagon. How many of you have heard of Hack the Pentagon? So once Microsoft had started doing bug bounties, it got the attention of a lot of organizations, including my government. And I was asked to come brief the US Pentagon about some of the game theory, economic theory, and all of the other types of information and data that went into planning the Microsoft bug bounties. So I want to call attention to a couple of numbers on here. When, when we opened up the doors for people to register, we were hoping to get a few hundred hackers, right? We had no idea that about triple what we were hoping for would show up. Over 1,400 hackers registered. Now, at the time, you had to provide your social security number in order to, you know, sort of validate it. Um, it wasn't so much for background checking. It was more um, because the initial version of Hack the Pentagon, they wanted to simplify things and make sure that they were paying uh, folks that uh, had a right to work in the United States. So it didn't have to be U.S. citizens, but it had to be people with tax IDs, basically. Now, I come from a very paranoid bunch of people, and some of my friends, when we launched this, were tweeting saying, I'm not giving the government that number. I have news for you, my friends. The government gave you that number. The government knows who you are and everything. They said, but they don't know my name. And I'm like, you are tweeting about it right now. Yeah, that is, that's what's happening. So I did send out a lot of tinfoil hats, you know, to my friends around this time. But the other numbers, the signal to noise ratio between the number of reports received and the actual valid bugs, it's a pretty bad signal to noise there, right? So what does that indicate? Well, there's a short bounty period of time, but what that really indicates is that there was a lot of duplicates, right? A lot of duplicate reports. What does that indicate? That particular thing indicates that there's a lot of low-hanging fruit that can be found by multiple people. And what does that indicate? That indicates that you have a lot more maturing to do before you're ready for a bug bounty. So one thing that I caution people, governments, other organizations, when they hear bug bounty, and they hear, well, we can just hire someone to help us with triage, I say, you know, let's be realistic. Have any of you tried the buffet? It's delicious, right? A buffet of bugs is also delicious, but imagine if you had no digestive system, how that would feel after a while, right? Very uncomfortable. So organizations thinking that all they need is help with the front end of consuming bugs and identifying bugs are in for a terrible, terrible surprise of bug indigestion if they actually lack the capacity to deal with it. And what would make you lack the capacity to deal with a bunch of bugs? Well, you've got a flood of low-hanging fruit coming in. Also, lesson learned, never start a bug bounty at midnight. Boy, that was a rough night. First bug report came in 13 minutes later. So let's take a look now at what is the reality of vulnerability management today. And as I said, over the last 20 years, we kept being hopeful that if we just kept telling people and organizations about these bugs and about classes of bugs and how to prevent them, that things would get so much better. But the fact of the matter is, organizations are not keeping up with vulnerability management as it is. Classes of bugs that should not exist anymore still do. And even when people are hiring us, either privately as penetration testers or paying us individually per bug with bug bounties, it does not guarantee 
that we're getting better at fixing or especially preventing classes of bugs. So how did we get here? I will tell you. Marketing. It was marketing. In the last 20 years, the security industry has gotten incredibly good at marketing solutions, right? I was part of a group called At Stake, and we were early application penetration testers, and we were unique in our advertising in that we said, you will never be 100% secure. Hardly any security companies will say that to you and expect you to buy stuff from them. So there's a lot of security products, and perhaps when applied correctly and at the right places, you might get some pretty good security, but usually security spending is somewhere between compliance and marketing buzzwords, and that's why we're here, right? So the thing is, everything is still broken, and in fact, we have situations where we thought if we just got vendors to fix things faster and provide patches faster, that that problem was the main problem and everything would be solved. But actually, patches being available is just one step in the whole ecosystem of becoming secure in vulnerability management. You have to apply the patches. Worms continue to rip through the internet because of vulnerabilities that are known, a patch is available and hasn't been applied. And that's exactly what we see today. So, what are you going to do? You know, we did a survey, and 94% 90, uh, of the Forbes Global 2000 have no published way to report a vulnerability to them at all. Right? They spend a lot of money on security products and services. But what does this mean? So, a lot of them suddenly realize that they have no mechanism here, and they decide, that's fine. We'll just put up a policy for vuln disclosure, or maybe start a bug bounty. We'll open the front door. Maybe we'll start out slowly. It'll be fine. It'll be like a lot of, I mean, maybe a rush, but mostly white hat, maybe a little gray hat. Friendly hackers coming, but actually it looks a little bit more like this. It's really hard to tell friend from foe, scanning activity, and especially, there are all these other factors. The US uh, Department of Justice put out guidelines to help organizations think through, if you are doing a vuln disclosure program or a bug bounty program, what data, if any, is in scope? A lot of uh, lawyers get involved in this policy writing time and they say things like, well, we'll just have no data in scope, no data exfiltration is allowed. If you have any data exfiltration, you are disallowed from participating in the bug bounty. And then I calmly look at them and I say, would you like to know if you're vulnerable to heart bleed? And they say, oh, of course, that's a five-year-old bug. And I said, well, to test for heart bleed, there's a, scooch, a little bit of data exfiltration involved. And they say, oh, we did not know that. Okay. So, Thinking through how you're going to react when someone accidentally, or what I call accidentally, violates your vuln disclosure policy in your determination, are they friend or foe, is actually quite important to think through. It's not just to avoid embarrassment, but it's to avoid tying up your incident response resources, tying up your legal resources. Why go after someone who actually isn't trying to hurt you after all? So if you hadn't thought through, how are you going to navigate sort of the edge cases around data? Now, that hearing that I showed you that I was a witness for was actually for the Uber data breach that was paid off to extortionists $100,000 via their bug bounty program. That hearing was before Congress to understand what is this bug bounty thing? How is it being used? Is it safe? And the fact of the matter is, this defensive market that we've been working so hard to create for fellow hackers, security researchers, is fragile, right? If people misunderstand it, it could end up overregulated and destroyed. The offense market will not be affected by this, only the defense market. So we had to be really careful. And so, if you think about it, what did those hackers do in particular? Well, they did more than a proof of concept when it came to data. They downloaded 57 million records. So that is obviously way more than you would need to prove the vulnerability. When they had this data, they contacted Uber. They actually did not know that Uber had a bug bounty. They were just saying, hey, we've got your data. What are you going to do about it? We expect to be paid. And in that hearing, Uber did actually admit to the fact that it was an extortion payment and that they, would, they had misused their bug bounty program and that they would never do so again. 
What I was worried about was the fact that we were setting a precedent. Follow the rules of a bug bounty program and you may get $10,000. Break the rules, download 57 million records, and you'll get 10 times that amount. What message were we sending to the bounty hunters of the world who might not know any better? And in fact, what happened was these specific hackers they signed the NDA, they deleted the data, they thought they were fine. And for that particular case, they were, until they tried it again against a subsidiary of LinkedIn and were indicted. Exact same thing. Now, you could say that maybe they were confused, or maybe they weren't, but saw that they got away with it, but whatever it was, it was not the outcome that the, uh, that the industry needed. And it was not the direction that we need to go. So, if you don't have the capacity to handle the vulnerabilities you know about or that are reported to you, good luck to you in the near future where we will have machine learning, artificial intelligence assisted vulnerability discovery. Any of you heard of the DARPA Cyber Grand Challenge? So when the folks at DARPA asked me for, you know, and, and lots of people about whether or not it made sense to do a full AI CTF, basically, capture the flag, and automate vulnerability finding, I said, you will overwhelm every single vulnerability receiving organization in the world. That will not be pretty. Talk about bug indigestion, right? We don't have the capacity to fix bugs at that rate. So there's still a lot more to think through and handle. I don't know if any of you have ever seen the old I Love Lucy, but this is the classic, Lucy and Ethel in the Chocolate Factory. And you know, it doesn't matter whether the vulnerability reports are perfect and clear and wonderful. If you have the lack of capacity to handle it, there is such a thing as too much chocolate. So I have a whole other presentation on a maturity model that I worked on that basically improves the ability for organizations to handle vulnerabilities. You'd think it's just engineering, but it's not. I mentioned some legal gray areas. There's certainly communication gray areas. We've certainly seen organizations that will shoot the messenger, that will go after security researchers for telling people about a vulnerability that hasn't been fixed in months or even years. So, one thing that I'm very passionate about is the fact that as I've gotten older, I've gone from wanting to do more offense work and hacking for a living to wanting to do more defense and maintenance. And in fact, the security jobs that we are trying to fill in the world, here in the region and everywhere, they're not exactly all offense-oriented jobs, are they? Keeping up with patching is just one element of defensive jobs in security. So what do I mean by this? The workforce shortage. We're not lacking hackers per se. We are certainly lacking folks with that skill set. But we're lacking what I call the dental hygienists of security, right? The stuff that isn't marketed as super sexy with the, you know, techno music and the hoodies and the pink hair and all of that stuff. This is about the maintenance and the prevention of vulnerabilities. And it's not as fun to talk about, I guess, but it's reality, right? So many security products and services will tell you things like, we have developed this brand new way to find all these flaws. That's great, knowing about them is half the battle. What about prevention? What about fixing? And what about having people with the skills to do all of those things in maintenance? You know, when I joined Microsoft, it was 2007. Popular Science decided to publish a list of the top 10 worst jobs in science. And we made that list. Oh, yes, we did. We were somewhere between elephant vasectomist and whale feces researcher. Yes, we made t-shirts with this list on it. But the point here is triage labor, which is part of this security ecosystem of actually fixing bugs, is really, really hard to source. 
It's a job that if you get good at it, you want out of it as soon as humanly possible. It ends up being repetitive. There are a lot of human issues that they have to balance. And usually they're somewhere striking a balance between a researcher who's reporting something and a product team who's maybe having a little bit of trouble understanding it or fixing it. And it's a tough job. Right? So we typically saw people wanting to leave that job at about the one year or 18 month mark. So in terms of security labor, we were constantly retraining these valuable people that were part of the security organism of Microsoft. And if you think about it, we just needed more Lucy's and more Ethel's in the chocolate factory, but we couldn't train them fast enough before they would leave. So, Bug bounties. Bug bounties are often touted as a way to address labor workforce shortages. It's this elastic group of hackers that will, you know, kind of pen test you on demand, give you all this coverage, but it's not like they're teaching you how to fix it necessarily. And they certainly aren't applying those fixes or um, techniques to your organization themselves because they are a wild labor workforce. And in terms of the labor market study that I had done um, as some research that I had done with MIT Sloan School, the bug hunting labor market is actually super stratified and it's comprised of a lot of people who know how to run simple tools and find low hanging fruit and very few people who are actually at the top of their game and who provide that true value, the kind that James Forshaw did when he came in with the mitigation bypass technique. Still super tiny. Now we had hope five years ago that we would be able to create and grow this labor market sort of at all skill levels, but that's not actually what occurred because people were starting bug bounties before they were ready. There's a lot of low hanging fruit. So essentially all the folks who wanted to start out with bug bounties and, and get paid, well, they basically, unless they were in this high skill level, were using common tools and techniques and spamming out, you know, most organizations that weren't even ready with a lot of bug reports. So it has this, this illusion, which I call bug bounty Botox, this illusion, and you're looking really, really busy and you're spending a lot of money on bugs. And yes, you may be fixing them very fast, but it's a class of bugs that you should have found yourself and been able to fix yourself and certainly learned those lessons to prevent from occurring over and over again in the future. One thing I told Congress, because whenever you're summoned before US Congress, you are supposed to, it's a formula when you testify. You say why you're so special that you have been invited, even though they were the ones inviting you. Then you talk about the subject at hand, and then you tell them what to do. That's how it works in, in the US. So what I told Congress that they needed to do is the fact that we are cranking out more bug writers than coders. The top 10 publicly funded universities for computer science in the United States have no requirement to graduate any computer science majors with security classes at all. Three of those top 10 universities don't offer security electives at all. How on earth are we ever going to get ahead of this bug problem if we are literally cranking out computer science majors who know zero about security? I know this problem is not unique to the United States. So I told them that as Congress and in charge of publicly funding universities, that they should make it a requirement that at least for the computer scientists take some security classes. And frankly, everyone should. All of us should in any discipline. God, give the business majors some computer science, uh, so, uh, computer security classes, please, right? At least some risk management. Now, here's what I want for you guys to take away from this. If you were to do something proactive and you're thinking about starting a bug bounty program or even a vulnerability disclosure program for the first time and digesting those bugs, audit your own systems first, please. You'd be surprised at how many customers come to my company and say, you are the one who starts bug bounties, right? And I said, maybe, if you're ready. Why do you want to start a bug bounty? And they say, well, we've never gotten a vuln report before in our lives. And I'm like, you are not ready. So let's get you ready. Audit your systems first, eliminate that low hanging fruit. After you have gotten a clear picture of what it is that you are vulnerable to, start building that digestive system for bugs so that you can handle it when someone brings you something incredibly valuable or incredibly mundane, right? And when you get something mundane, ask yourself the question, how did we miss this? How do we improve the processes so that we don't make the same mistakes over and over again? 
And then think about your labor workforce. I know it's sexy to hire more and more hackers or you know, employ them under contract, and I'm all for that. Creating ways for me and my people to stay out of jail and make money has been a life's work for me. But think about the balance of the workforce. Do you need more hackers or do you need more people applying the patches and working on prevention? Take a good look. And then finally, beware of perverse incentives. I know my friends at Apple just offered a whole bunch more money for, uh, for exploits for certain targets. Over a million dollars is up on the table from the Apple folks. Now, if you think about that, how many software engineers make a million dollars? How many testers make a million dollars? Think about what you might be doing to your labor workforce of the future if your defensive prices keep going higher and higher. How will you staff your own organizations to prevent bugs if the kids coming up today just want to do bug bounty. I know I certainly wouldn't have sat through a single corporate meeting in my entire life if there had been sky-high bug bounties available to me when I was in my 20s or younger. Absolutely not would I ever have taken a corporate job and then think of all of the things that wouldn't have happened inside these corporations if I hadn't had to, you know, work for a living, right? Think about the future. The offense market can go as high as it wants. It's not going to feel a thing. A million dollars offered by Apple, that's okay. Offense market makes it two million. You're not competing with the offense market by raising the prices. You're competing with yourself and your future. So bring balance to the workforce. Understand your actual needs, your weak points, and not just on an individual bug basis, but on an overall systemic basis. I keep using analogies, you know, referring back to the human body because we can all relate to it. But think of your organization as an organism. And keeping it healthy is all about preventive maintenance, right? Way easier to treat root causes and, pre and do prevention than it is to try and cure the disease of low-hanging fruit bugs. And I'll give you one last thought, and I will be able to take a couple questions. The thought here, actually, person right there in the audience taking a picture of herself, <laughs> and hopefully, are you speaking as well? Okay, well, you should definitely speak to this lady right here. She's one of my heroes. Um, she is a nurse, and as we know, medical devices are hackable these days. Someone thought it was a great idea to just, you know, put them on the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth. But here's the thing. She inspires me because every single profession today, every single industry is touched by cybersecurity. And when we think about our labor workforce and the, the maintainers that we need, we need people who are the stewards of their profession getting interested, just like her, in making things better. One last thought. The lady who you can see celebrating in that corner, uh, taking a selfie with her friend, had just won a CTF. The little girl with the red ribbon in her hair is her daughter, doing some lock picking, looks like, maybe soldering, something like that. When this woman was pregnant, she was homeless. So my point here is that to meet the demands of the true labor workforce, not just the hackers, but the maintainers, we need to draw from every industry. We need to draw from every gender. We need to draw from every socio socioeconomic background because it's gonna take all of us to secure the future. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Katie. <clears throat> One of the knights of the pwn table, I've been told. That yes, exactly. I've been knighted. <laughs> I'm a judge of the of the uh, bounty competition over there. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's uh, the bounty competition is just behind the CTF. 
Uh, Driven to Pwn is a bug bounty marketplace, and it's the only um, bounty bazaar in this format around at the moment, right? Mm -hmm. So please thank her once more for bringing this around here. Do we have time for a question? Do we have time for one question? Yes, we do. All right. We have, we have time for questions. First, let's do the live questions. The first one over here. Uh, first of all, bet off the president, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> no, that's okay. If he doesn't make it, you know, I could go in 2024. All right, go for it, girl. Um, <laughs> I have a couple of questions, but I'll just ask uh, one because I think other people want to take the opportunity as well. Uh, thanks for the great talk, as always, Katie. Um, my only one and only question is, aren't we uh, just funneling a, a lot of uh, common sense bugs and like common lowest denominator, low hanging fruit kind of stuff from uh, most bounty hunting, uh, bounty, uh, bounty hunting programs. Uh, and uh, isn't it becoming a, a job for the kind of uh, code monkeys kind of to start finding bugs rather than focusing on uh, a lot of the more important and critical vulnerabilities that can hurt the internet? Uh, example is WannaCry, uh, you know, like this thing was uh, well researched by uh, you know who. Uh, and uh, there are quite a few of these probably uh, sitting down in the shadows. So you think that's going to come through a bug bounty program? And uh, to give this a twist, uh, you know, the Chinese government, obviously, with the regulations in terms of, uh, well, you know who's been, who's been winning pawn to own competitions year after year and suddenly they disappeared. Oh, uh, I know. <laughs> so uh, you've been there, saw that. Uh, so there's a little bit of an arms race that happens outside the bug bounty program and bug bounty programs produce low quality, low hanging fruits kind of stuff. So some bug bounties definitely do produce a lot of low hanging fruit, which is uh, a huge problem. But if organizations actually are focused on their own maturity, those low hanging fruit bugs are a lot fewer and fewer to find, right? And that's actually one of the thing, one of the characteristics you want to go for. You want to go from a lot of low hanging fruit bug classes that are known and easily discoverable to fewer and fewer bugs and more complex bugs over time. To your question of do I think that um, that, that essentially that, that some of these more complex vulnerabilities are findable via bug bounty. Well, yes, absolutely, if you structure them properly. That was exactly what I did at Microsoft in terms of saying, we don't just want the exploit like Pwn to Own would get. We want the exploitation technique. We want to know how you are doing this that's unique so that we can make fine-tuned changes to the operating system and then allow the time for all the developers to adapt to those changes in the future. Um, I think that overall, bug bounties are an important tool that you can use in the toolbox, but if we look at the bug bounty platform's data that they publish year after year, mm -hmm. you keep seeing the most common class of vulnerability is cross-site scripting and authentication issues. I have seen bug bounties get paid out. I saw a news article positively saying, look at this wonderful use of a bug bounty. A thousand dollars was paid to a researcher who found that there was an API leaking all kinds of personal data with zero authentication. Why would you pay a thousand dollars to a person to tell you that you actually should put authentication on something as valuable as an API that has access to all your data? Why would you do such a thing? And yet, the media was reporting it as if this was a grand success of bug bounties. Now, that particular story was about a telco. And what happened was when that reporter wrote that, some other hackers contacted them saying, actually, we had been exploiting this for quite some time. Because of course, the company, when asked for a comment for the original article, said, we have no evidence of exploitation. Well, now, how would you know You've got no logs about it. it. There's no authentication. That's the nature of the bug. But anyway, this hacker reached out and said, yep, I've been exploiting this, and me and my friends have been exploiting this for a long time. So if you think about it, yes, if you structure these bug bounties intelligently, they can be a great tool. If you just use them to disguise your negligence and make it seem like diligence, you will be found out eventually. OK, next question. Um, thanks for your presentation. Um, in fact, I had two questions. So, <laughs> so the first one is: That's good. 
what's your view about the bug bounty programs as a, a mean to fund the bad guys for their bad intention, which is a bigger agenda that they have in the background. So, so what, what's your view on this one? So as in uh, bug bounty hunters kind of playing in the legit market to get money and then investing it elsewhere? Is that what? Yes. I mean, you know, they could always just go straight to crime also. I mean, pretty sure that that one bug with the zero authentication on the API, yeah, they could have sold access to that as well. So I'm not so sure there's a huge amount of that going on. Now, that being said, I've been a hacker for a very long time. And as my friends and I have all grown up in this industry, I certainly remember some of my friends donning suits while they still commanded botnets on the side, right? So there are, I don't know, people, people will, uh, will call people white hat or black hat or gray hat, green hat if you're just doing bug bounties, right? Making money. Um, but I look at it as every individual has choices to make with each bug. It's like, it's like a yellow light. How many of you have all made the exact same choice every time you encounter a yellow light? Probably not, right? So I think that it's more complex. I think that if people are given incentives to choose maybe not the most payout, because that would be offense market type of payout, but lesser payout with public recognition, they may choose that. And actually one of the most successful bug bounty hunters um, you know, on, the plat on all of the platforms, he's made over a million dollars, um, he was a convicted hacker for before. He's made over a million dollars now. And when asked, he'd actually prefer a regular job with a regular salary. So I think, I mean, to your point, it's a little bit more complex than just people are playing in one market or another. I think people evolve over time and what they want out of life changes. When he was asked by somebody, why would you want to take a lower paying job to find those same bugs? Why would you want to go work at the company that's paid you over a million dollars in bug bounty for a regular salary? And he said, it's because I have a daughter and I really just want stability for her, right? So people's motivations change. So that is the second question very quickly. Oh boy. So it's related <laughs> to the same one. So again, what's your view about the crowdsourcing kind of things? Because I think there are companies that are starting crowdsourcing these kind of uh, like bug bounty programs. So would that be a better option where you know your opponent, he's certified, registered with this particular company, everything is being recorded the way he has been exploiting or trying to find a bug and all those kind of things. So, so it's like, you know, it, it's a bit more trusted than someone who's doing something that you totally unaware what he's doing. So that, that is essentially what you're talking about there is a penetration test, um, really, um, but it's just with a larger group of pen testers potentially. The problem that we've seen in the labor market uh, that has been actively participating in bug bounties is that the most financially successful ones are the ones who know to sort of go to areas that maybe haven't been combed over yet and get you know a bunch of the, the bugs that way. Um, but they also know when to abandon a target and move on to something that's more lucrative. So the assumption that any time you turn on a crowdsourced you know, uh, bug bounty that you're getting hundreds of thousands of eyes is absolutely false. Um, I think the numbers from Hacker One is that they've got half a million hackers signed up. Well, actually, if you drill down, less than 10% of those ever submitted a bug at all. And only 100 individuals have ever made over $100,000 in bug bounty lifetime on the platform. And at the time that they did this data poll, only two had made a million dollars over time. So the illusion there that there's this unlimited pool of people who are willing to gamble their time in exchange for your money is false. Okay, one more question? Um, uh, all right. I, here, here you go. Uh, sorry, uh, you said something about the, the labor pool, finding people... Uh, on the on the good side and defense side, uh, I, I've been looking for for uh, been contacted by a lot of recruiters over the last few months regarding uh, AppSec, applicant security, and mostly about people reviewing source code for companies and 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 they're they're offering quite a bit of money. Uh, in, in, um, 
uh, six figures uh, to two, three hundred grand that they're offering versus say a uh, hundred thousand dollars for a regular developer, but but they're willing to pull in applicant security people to come and review their source code and and what you said kill classes of bugs. Look at what's coming out. Uh, do you think that's a better tactic than going with the bug bounties, or is it, is it in hand in hand with that? So you you find the bugs, you find the people, you hire the people in staff. Uh, also. Um, they're, they're, they're mostly when, they, when these recruiters are calling, they're, they're trying to fix the problem with a, by throwing money at it again, by throwing out a higher, higher side than you would pay your, your normal developer, instead of saying, to sending your entire developers for a month or, or a couple of weeks to a training course to learn how to fix the class of bugs. Is, is that a better way than hiring out at the high rate? Well, I mean, I think the, the labor market balance is really what I'm after here. And we have yet to see what striking the right balance is really going to look like. Especially, you know, we haven't seen um, huge leaps in AI yet, right? That might change a lot. If a lot of this low-hanging fruit ends up being um, dealt with at, in terms of at least discovery by AI, or, you know, even potential hot patching done by AI, that was also part of, like, the DARPA grand challenge, was the AI had to do both. It had to attack and defend we might see changes in this labor market. So the answer to your question is I'm not sure what the right balance is for this labor market. We are still discovering it. What I do know is that if we overpay in defense for individual bugs or individual exploit classes, we are definitely not doing ourselves a favor in terms of priming the labor market of the future for defense. I think that's all the time we have. Is that right? Or one more? It is the time, but we have a, oh, we have a good question from you. Okay, so okay. let's just cover the first one. Yeah. Okay, the first one. How do you suggest shifting the labor force from offensive jobs to defensive and maintenance ones? You know what? It's not necessarily about shifting from offensive jobs to defensive and maintenance in terms of the labor force. It's about shifting the mindset of the organizations who are paying for the jobs. How many of you have been the only security person in your organization and that was because you raised your hand and said, we really need a security person in this organization, right? I certainly started out that way. So why are your organizations not investing in creating roles to support the organization when it comes to security? Why are they waiting until the end when offense, you know, type of workers, so bug bounty hunters, penetration testers, basically people who are there to find what you should have prevented or fixed. So the organizations themselves have to make the shift. It's not the labor market. It's really the orgs. And then last question, I guess. Sure. Uh, you've mentioned people starting off as bug bounty hunters somewhat prematurely. Is there a resource that you're aware of that uh, outlines a common core for hacking fundamentals? You know what? It's not about the people starting off at bug bounty hunters. In, uh, prevent, uh, sorry. Not about people starting off as bug bounty hunters prematurely because I think that, you know, if an organization has said it is legal for you to hack us and we'll pay you money, I would love to see tiny, tiny children starting to do uh, bug bounty hunting and trying that out. Um, but to the question is, is there a common core of hacking fundamentals? There are tons of resources. Step one, young hackers, Google how to hack, you know, I mean, honestly, when, when I talk about it, it's funny. It's the usual old person talk, right? There was no Google when I learned to hack. We had to hack uphill both ways in the snow, right? So go ahead, find the resources. Absolutely, there are training resources. There are training classes. There have been CTFs. There are hands-on opportunities all over the world and online to learn how to hack. And go for it, young as you want. Katie, as the person who helped um, edit the ISO on vulnerability disclosure and as the person who was the technical expert for the Wassenaar arrangement, thank you very much for all your insight today. Hey, thank you.